Hello everyone, this is Under the Mayo. Welcome to another episode of Profiles in Gaming Enthusiasm. I am joined with a very special guest today, Sam, the developer of Turbo Overkill. Sam, how are you doing today? Doing good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right. I just had some dinner. I'm, I'm full. I've got a little fruit juice on my side, and I'm ready to have mm. uh, a fun conversation with uh, a developer that I've really come to admire. This is really cool having you on here. I've wanted to talk to you for a while. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, hon honored to be part of this. This is great. Um, so uh, I figured I'd just uh, kick things off with uh, you personally. Like, what's your what's your gaming history? Uh, I mean, if uh, for those of you listening who don't know, um, Sam is a developer of Turbo Overkill, which just came out in early access back in March. Was that a, the official? Uh, the demo was March. Did it also come out officially in early access in March? I don't remember. I, uh, it's actually so long ago, I've forgotten myself. I well, think it yeah. was, I think the demo was February, which was part of the okay. Steam Next phase. Yeah. And then the release was, I think it was April 22nd. I, I remember because, uh, it was a bit of a mistake, but we decided to release the first episode during the middle of PAX, which was an absolute nightmare because I had to run the booth and release the game at the same time oh. and i uh any any indie devs listening i would not recommend doing that <laughs> it's just a lot of work oh god and especially since you're a you're a one-man team so you've got to handle mm. everything yourself yeah for the most part um i have been fortunate to be able to work with apogee they help me out with a lot of the, the stuff i don't want to have to deal with and uh sure i have uh jiren on board as a producer he's he's been he's been amazing to work with because uh his background's in music Mm -hmm. um uh, music production so he's did, did he do the he music for of, turbo overkill no but uh he knows he knows a lot of uh really talented musicians okay. um so you know stuff like you know soundtracks which you you would know is very important and yeah. a first person shooter of, of um, course he, yeah i i didn't know if he did the music I, I like the music in the game a lot i just haven't looked into who did it so yeah it's um two producers uh, uh nicola and chipper I hope I didn't butcher their names, but uh, they, yeah, they've been amazing. They've done some incredible work on the game so far. Well, that um, that kind of shifts me into one of the questions I already had on my list, which was how did you get involved with Apogee for the release of Turbo Overkill? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny story. Um, I've, uh, when I was growing up, I played a lot of Apogee games, starting with Monster Bash and... Uh, from that to Rise of the Triad, and then eventually all the 3D Realms games. Uh, so I, I have been following him for quite a bit. Um, and it was around about, I think, 2000, 2021, I think it was, when I was working at Rocketworks, um, which was it's, uh, Dean Hall's company. And uh, I was working there, and I was doing Turbo Overkill on the side. So I didn't have a lot of time to dedicate towards it, so I was kind of itching to get a hold of a publisher and I had been talking to a few of them but uh at the same time I was talking to publishers I saw that Apogee were publishing games again uh when mm -hmm. they released their um kind of like a a reel of games they were working on uh it was funny because I messaged them uh on I think it was I think I messaged them on Twitter no I messaged them on email and at the exact same time I messaged them Jaren messaged me on Twitter so it's kind of like we were having communications with each other but it wasn't through the same the same line um and from there uh you know i got to talk to jaren i got to talk, to talk to scott miller and uh it was basically a bit of back and forth for a few months and then um because it was them i was talking to apogee and another publisher at the time but um seeing apogee's history and knowing you know being familiar with their games i was very very keen to be able to work with them and uh the relationships has been just been amazing so far uh, def definitely want to stick with them for you know for turbo overkill and and you know a lot more future projects yes oh that's great i mean it's great that you're happy i mean not i mean i've uh, i've talked to some developers who have just had nightmare stories with their publishers and so it's nice to hear that someone's actually having a good experience yeah well it's uh yeah i've never worked with a publisher before actually turbo overkill is kind of the it's the first game i've been proud enough to release on steam and mm -hmm. you know put a price tag on um but uh, I've never worked with publishers before, and I was fully aware of the you know the nightmare stories and what to watch out for. But uh, fortunately, they've they've been they've been amazing so far. Like I haven't had any any problems working with with them. It's also nice to see, you know, 
um, like sadly, you know, I don't get a lot of time to look at all the all of the views that go up online, but they mm -hmm. they, they watch a lot of the views, like even uh, even stuff that I you know really like the views that don't have a lot of views and stuff like that. Like they look at everything that comes in, and uh, you know they usually pass it on to me, and I watch it and. I have, a little, I have a little notepad document that I keep, and I, every time I watch a review, I just write down all the stuff that that needs to, you know, uh, maybe fix this, maybe fix that. Um, but yeah, they they they've been great. They've been very involved, um, you know, post release, which was another thing I was worried about. Uh, you know, hearing about some publishers where they just, you know, they push a the game out and then they leave it, and then you never they never touch it again. But mm -hmm. they've been quite active with, you know, the post release process, which which has been good. Well, that's awesome. Um, I wanted to ask, what's what's your personal gaming history? What was your first console, and what game got you into the first-person shooter genre? Uh, so I believe far back as I remember, I mean, it was definitely Monster Bash. That was the first game I, that kind of got me into gaming back in the DOS days. Okay. I mean, I'm sure there were many many other games that I played that I just don't remember, but that was kind of the one that hooked me. Um, and from there, I it didn't take too long until I got my hands on Doom, like the original Doom. Mm -hmm. I was probably about four or five years old. So, <laughs> whatever my parents were doing, um, that probably wasn't probably wasn't good. But uh, you know, letting me play such a violent game at such a young age. But uh, ever since I played Doom, I just got I just got hooked. Um, and I've been doing. I can't think of any other game I've played as much since I started playing that. Like I played it i made maps for it for a long long time um, right when did you start uh, so making it, maps probably i mean it was probably around the age of six it's wow probably, you started making your own maps at age six yeah they, they were pretty bad though i wouldn't <laughs> well no i mean they don't have to be good i mean just just but it's like yeah. you started so early like it it makes sense honestly seeing the quality of the map design of turbo overkill i mean it makes sense that you started early and that you've just been thinking about it ever since yeah i think it was it was definitely doom that kind of pushed me in the direction of wanting to wanting to be a, a game designer um so i remember I, I used to play around with a lot of 2d engines stuff like click and play and um it was stuff on the on the mid 90s um i didn't it's kind of funny though because i didn't actually get into proper you know using an engine like unity until you know 2014 or something so I did take a break from it for a while, but um, yeah, it's kind of been part of my life for as long as I remember, just making video games. Um, and I, I haven't gotten bored of it yet, so I, I do hope to Good. You know, keep doing it for a while now. Uh, were you always a PC guy, or did you have a console period, or do you play any console hey, games? <clears throat> yeah, I had, a, I had a Nintendo 64. Okay. Um, I can't remember what I played, though. It was... You know, mostly just the classics like Mario, Zelda, GoldenEye. Um, I skipped I skipped the Xbox, PlayStation thing. I didn't really play a lot of. I mean, I, I bought an Xbox much later just to play Halo, and then I bought a PlayStation just to play um, Uncharted. So mm -hmm. I haven't actually. I wasn't really big on the whole console thing. I kind of mostly been sticking with PC when okay. it comes to gaming. Hmm. Yeah, I had uh, kind of a PC break. Like I. Uh, I got into PC gaming with Command and Conquer, like the old mm. Command and Conquer and Red Alert series, and you know. But I I missed out on Quake, but I was playing a lot of Duke mm. Nukem. Uh, but then I got into Quake Two, and then Unreal Tournament. But then after that, I was pretty much console for a while. You know, just you know, mm. all my God of War stuff and survival horror, Metal Gear Solid, all the Twisted Metal. I was all over the console, PlayStation stuff. Um, mm. But I would dip back and forth into PC Fear, Half-Life 2 uh, but only like starting in 2015 really when I discovered Brutal Doom and I was like oh wow this is pretty cool and then I got back into PC gaming and now now, it's just, now I just can't even stand to play on console unless I absolutely have to yeah, <laughs> like, well I think yeah. PC I think PC ruined it for me because I, I can't play a game below 60 FPS anymore it mm -hmm. just feels like lagging all yeah. the time actually I, I got a, I got a uh, like a monitor that's something like 240 something hertz and it's like now i can't even play 60 fps games it's oh like, i know dude <laughs> we get so spoiled i i got yeah uh, i i jumped into the high frame rate thing when uh the the mod the pc mod for horde mode came out for doom eternal in 2020 mm. and uh, i i got my first 
a high frame rate uh, monitor and I, I played it and I was like, wow, this is incredible. This is like, you can't explain it to someone. And, like they have to see it. It's kind of like VR, exactly, right? Yeah. You can't explain VR to someone like well, how it actually feels to play it. And mm. and then I and then I went back to 60 FPS and it, it hurt my eyes and I felt so spoiled. Mm. Like I can't go back. <laughs> I can't go back at all. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a, definitely a game changer. Um, I, yeah, I I can't go back. I find it helps my um, aim too. Mm. Yeah, I feel like yeah, I'm well, more accurate. I don't know what it is. It just it just feels wrong. I mean, I know it sounds a bit elitist saying this, but it just feels wrong playing it anything, <laughs> anything lower. It's like whenever I play, when even playing Turbo Overkill on like a like a, I got a Steam Deck recently, um, mm. playing it on that, it's like it just feels like the game's poorly optimized despite it running at what's well, almost 60 FPS. Um, yeah. It's like oh no, the game still feels like it's lagging, but it's like well no, it's it's the maximum refresh rate of you know the device I'm playing it on. Yeah, uh, I mean, I feel bad sometimes when I'm like, this game can't hold a consistent 120 frames. This game sucks. <laughs> but, but I'm like, as yeah. long as it can hit 60, but then you play games where it's like, you're when you're dropping from 120 to 20, <laughs> then, then, you, then yeah, you've got a real bad. problem. <laughs> and that's not me being yeah. spoiled. That's, that's You have an issue. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to ask... Um, Ooh, can you give us like a breakdown of your history as a developer? Uh, you, you told us that you got into early Doom uh, map creation, but when did you start making your own games? And uh, when did you uh, when did you see that as like a like a, a real career direction as you got close to the development of Turbo Overkill? Hmm. Well, it's kind of funny because I like so I have been developing smaller games for quite a while. Uh, I did have a, a brief stint making mobile games but it was uh i mean i spent about five or six years on that and it didn't really go anywhere huh. uh, i think the most money i made out of it was uh five hundred dollars by selling a premium game um five hundred dollars total I, total yeah oh. so i the I only, I only really developed two games for mobile one was like a, a shmup like a top-down shooter yeah um i released that for free with ads got it got quite a few plays but well we got thirty thousand plays which isn't a lot but i mean for me at the time i thought it was of course no i mean yeah massive. uh but that didn't make any money uh and then i released a game for it's like a horror a short horror game for about two dollars and he made about you know five hundred five hundred dollars in total and um so it wasn't really until turbo overkill that i realized that i could make a career out of this um what when when did that hit you it was like did you realize that you could make a career out of this while you were making the game and you saw the potential or just because you saw the reception and the sales that it got? It was mostly the reception. Um, I Actually, it was a bit earlier on when I saw that. I put a few clips out on Twitter um, and it got a bit of traction. I realized, okay, maybe people actually want to play a game like this. Yeah. Um, cause when, I, when I started Turbo Overkill, I, I wasn't really doing it for... I was just doing it for fun, really. I didn't really think I'd make any money out of it. Um, I basically set out to make a game that I wanted to play, which was... Well, that's a good way like, to make a game, man. <laughs> like, make yeah, yeah. make the game you want to make. Exactly, yeah. It's I, I've had... You know, it's been a blast making it, um, which kind of... For me, it was more of a hobby. I was like, okay, I'll just make a game I want to play. Um, it wasn't until I got a lot of traction out of it online that I realized, you know, maybe... Maybe this is a game of like if I get this to a point where I'm happy with it, it's probably something I might be able to you know, sell to an audience. Because um, I mean, early on, I most of the stuff I made, I didn't really think was good enough to you know ask for you know ask money for. So I kind of just released it for free, or I released it for a really small amount of money. Um, so I didn't really feel I could turn this into a job until yeah until Apogee came along and you know they said okay well. Yeah, we'll pay you in advance to, to make the game, and then I realize, okay, now I can actually quit my job and, you know, work on this full time, um, which was kind of the point where I realized, like, okay, now maybe now I'm actually a game developer. You know, mm. I don't have to I have to work for someone else's company. I can just work on myself. You know, work for myself. Well, you've made something that is, 
it's really really impressive and especially considering the direction that it's taken like there's there's been this uh revival of the the boomer shooter as so many people call it um mm. and I don't know. It, I, I've played a lot of them. I haven't played all of them. I mean, I don't play every first-person shooter that comes out, but I, I think that your game is probably the most impressive, like campaign-focused first-person shooter in the indie scene since Dusk, and uh, it's been really exciting to to cover and to play and to to push. You know, try. You know, mm-hmm. like. Uh, I, I don't have the most views on my videos about Turbo Overkill, but every time I do talk about Turbo Overkill, it turns someone on to the game. There's always someone who's like, I'm going to check this game out, and I, that, I'm so happy that it that it happens, because, I don't know, I, th- I think that you've made one of the most interesting uh, first-person shooters in recent memory, and I just want to congratulate you on the on the success. Whatever success you've had with it, I wanted to say you know, congratulations and thank you. No, oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it, um, especially because I, I, you know, mentioning Dusk, um, that was kind of one of the games that did push me towards trying to actually, you know, actually trying because I, I was doing a lot of mobile games at the time, and I didn't, I loved first-person shooters, but for some reason, I don't know why, I just never actually sat down to try and make my own first-person shooter. But it wasn't until I played Dusk, like you know how legendary that game was i realized you know maybe i should try give it a shot i imagine dusk really sparked something inside of a lot of indie developers right yeah it's actually i just finished a, a another playthrough of it um of, you know last week um it's yeah it, it holds up really well yeah it's still really like uh, the level design just the, the where that game goes by uh, you know, I always I, I recommend Dusk to a lot of people, and you know some people are like ah, I don't get it. You know you're walking around, you're shooting dumb AI and with your super shotgun, mm-hmm. like whatever. And I'm like oh you know what? Like that first episode is just like him kind of like stretching his legs and kind of figuring out what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Episode two is when he knows what he's doing and he knows what he wants to do, and it's like the the quality of the game just skyrockets. And you get to those super interesting levels with all that verticality, and it's, yeah, it become it becomes just one of the one of the best games I've ever played. Yeah, I I think it's something something that drew me towards the level design from the old Doom games. It's how abstract it can get. You mm-hmm. know, the further through the game you get, and like dusk, like you get halfway through episode two, and especially a lot of episode three, there's just it just surprises you with so much stuff that doesn't make any sense but as you're playing it it doesn't matter because it's fun to figure out it exactly, becomes yeah. puzzle like in a way and that's it's not in a way that where you're like wandering around for 30 minutes trying to figure out where to go because you can't find the key card but it's mm. it but fun in that you're just like oh well this hallway connects to this hallway and if i go back mm. up this way i don't you know it's it's fun and uh i mean i don't know if he's if uh david zemanski is ever going to do another FPS or another uh, follow, like a follow up to Dusk, but man, if he ever did, I mean, he would have an, an army of people there ready to play it. Oh yeah, yeah, I'd totally, totally be on board to play uh, to give it a crack. I played as uh, Chop Goblins recently, which was which was fun. Yeah, a I, friend I of mine told it. me about that. I gotta check that out. Hmm. He he told me you just chopped goblins, <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> well that sounds fun. <laughs> it's, it's ba- bas- basically, all you do is just, just Kill goblins. He seems to be focused on just like simple concepts right now. Like uh, all what was the, what was the other one called? Iron what? What was it? Iron uh, Iron Lung. Yeah, I I played a little mm. bit. It, it's not it's not for me, <laughs> uh, it, but it's a it, really fascinating concept that I could really see people getting into. Mm. Yeah, there's a a good. Uh, I didn't. I must confess, I didn't finish the whole thing. I I played about. I think I played twenty minutes of it. Yeah. Um, and then I got sidetracked, and I, I didn't get back into it, unfortunately. But I watched a, a Pyro Cynical video about, you know, he does a really good deep dive into the whole, uh, like, the lore oh, behind the okay. game. Um, there's, like, a, in the game, there's, like, a terminal in the game, which has this, uh, kind of gives you information about, you know, the game's backstory, and the, the you know, it does a lot of world building. But it, it sounds really, you know, the world he's made there sounds really, really interesting. I didn't um, even know so there I, was lore to Iron Lung. I gotta watch that. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, it definitely makes me want to, you know, when I when I find some time to, to jump back in and give it another shot. Um, 
you said that uh, Dusk was uh, was an influence on you. Um, uh, could you state any of the other influences that uh, that helped shape the the world and the the direction and the combat of uh, of Turbo Overkill? Yeah. So it's I, I usually when I think back on it, I find it comes from unexpected places. Like the the chainsaw slide ability, I I got that idea from um, Apex Legends out of all things, just because. Um, like when I when I was playing Apex, I played a lot of Pathfinder and just the you know, the ability to grapple off a you know off a distant building and then like activate your slide to get more momentum. I when I was doing early prototypes of Turbo, I really wanted to get you know a slide mechanic just like that mm -hmm. into into the game. Um, so stuff like that. I think the Cyberpunk thing it's mostly stemmed from something. Something I've enjoyed in, you know, like, you know, movies like Blade Runner and whatnot. Um, I've always wanted to do something in that setting. Um, so there, there, I can't really think of any, like, one inspiration for the whole cyberpunk thing. Yeah. Um, Did you, I mean, it was most... you must have enjoyed uh, the new Blade Runner then. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's that like a sensory overload kind of a movie. <laughs> He's, uh, I... Um, can't, I can't say his last name, but Dennis it's, I mean, usually, Vill Villeneuve? Is that it? Yeah, yeah. I'm usually quite drawn to his movies. Oh, um, yeah. Even if I don't like the the story, like, I don't I don't like all of his movies, but I like mm -hmm. watching all of his movies, because he's so mm -hmm. good. His, his direction and whoever his cinematographer is, they are fantastic. Yeah. I can watch anything he does. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's used the same cinematographer for most of his movies that could be completely that, 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 that I mean that would make sense right because mm. it, there's yeah like kind of like a like a Paul Verhoeven thing like he used the same cinematographer for Robocop and Total Recall mm. and so if you watch those movies and you think about that they look like the same movie in a lot of ways mm. yeah yeah uh, so um, how uh, how happy are you are with the reception so far is, is there like a I, I don't keep my ear too close to the ground with how every single game I cover is doing. Uh, so, do do you see a healthy community growing around your game, or is there a good mod scene going on? Yeah. So, the modding's modding's not so hot right now because I, I completely broke it with a recent update. So, oh. I, I mean, that's a good thing about early access is um, it's the it, it, community's been amazing, um, especially. Uh, the people on Discord, um, you always see the, the same people come back every now and then, and uh, I, I usually find the Discord community is really good for, you know, they they have a lot of really good feedback on how you know ways they you know where they think the game should go, and I, I usually do a lot of polls, um, so it's like, oh, you know, what do you think of this mechanic or what do you think of that mechanic? Um, so they, they've been working with them's been great, especially you know being early access. Um, I could go back and sort of uh pivot the game in a direction where i feel the majority of people are going to enjoy it more mm -hmm. um doesn't always go so well uh there, there have been a few people that said you know okay maybe maybe we're changing too many things um especially with some of the level refactors I, there's usually a lot of people that like the stuff that used to be there um like what but, so stuff like um i mean so there were there was one I think when we released the first episode, the worst one of the worst levels was the last one because you know most of the people that played it couldn't really figure out where to go. See um, that 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 like... has always kind of puzzled me. Um, like I I know that you you changed it because of that, and cool, I support that change. And I I, I replayed the last level rec when I uh, reviewed Act Two, and it's and it felt good. It was fun. Um, but I never, I never experienced that. I was just always like, okay, looking around, where do I go? Okay, I'm going to jump on this car yeah. and figure out where to go. And I never had a problem with it. But then I heard a lot of people had a problem with it. And so I guess I was just in the min minority. And so, I mean, I guess it was a positive change if people were really having trouble with it. Yeah, I, I think you were one of the lucky ones. Yeah, I, I, maybe I was just lucky and I just happened to stumble upon what I needed to do. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen playthroughs of people on the original level. They would not jump on any cars but they'll keep trying to cross on the train and uh, accidentally break the game to keep progressing through the level and somehow they get to the point they're supposed to get to and it feels like i was like oh i'm back on track or you know was that a legitimate part of the level which mm -hmm. it wasn't okay um so 
you know when when that was i saw that was an issue um you know i took it to the, the discord community and said you know okay hey what are ways that the civil can change in a way to um you know be a bit more streamlined or you know make more sense and you know they you know they do they usually there's usually quite a few you know really good discuss you know we you, we have a lot of good discussions on there um about ways that could um you know improve the game they're not it's not always like civilized but most of the time <laughs> um you know we come to an agreement and say okay this you know maybe we should go this in this direction um and with that level we did you know i did a bit big refactor on it for about a week and basically streamlined it so it's like okay instead of going from the train to the cars to the train you just start on the cars and then when you jump onto the train that's it that's you, it you just stay on the train for the rest of the level well, there, well, there's still like a little bit of like you're on the train and then you have to like jump on two cars to get to the next train, like a little bit. Like mm. you, you sprinkle it in, yeah. and I think that keeps it fresh. Yeah, like I remember uh, there's a section where uh, a monorail shows up and you got to jump on the monorail. Um, and the, when I first put that out, originally it was just you uh, stuck on the monorail. It's a big narrow hallway. Tell everything that is in front of you. But somebody on Discord had a really good idea of saying, okay, what if you have the monorail but you have cars on the outside that you can like jump out of the monorail on you know jump on a car and then jump back into the monorail hmm. um and but you so i put that change out and uh, it took me about a week and most of the people liked it but there were some people that still preferred the original broken version of the level which i <laughs> i didn't really understand but i was like okay well uh yeah I, I guess you can't please everyone at the end of the day yeah i don't know if i prefer the original version i just didn't remember having an issue with it but like i said when mm. i went back and replayed it uh in the current version I, mean, I had a great time with it it seems also that you really revamped the combat there's like this huge like uh this is huge arena fight somewhere near the end where it has the mm. two running walls up on the side mm. and all the rockets and oh man what a fight man <laughs> you've got you yeah. you have some really really good arena fights in in your game and it, it's i imagine it's not something to get right easily like what enemies are going to show up at what time and what's the arena mm. going to look like i mean it how long does it take you to design an arena encounter it's uh it's really weird my process for arenas is really strange cuz i usually find the arenas I don't spend a lot of time creating are usually the ones that end up being the best for some reason. I, I have no idea why. Um, but usually, you know, my process will be at a grey box out an arena. I'd say, okay, you know, I have a rough idea on what kind of shape I want. I'll drop a few jump pads in and wall running platforms. Um, and then when it comes to monsters, like when I place monsters in, it's usually, it's usually just a lot of trial and error. Um, I don't really have a process that I follow for every arena design. I kind of just throw it in and play it. And if it appeals good to me, then usually it's what ends up in the final game. Do um, Do you start? Do you always start in in engine building something from scratch, or do you ever just like you're out you're out at dinner and then you're like, oh, I have an idea, and you pull out and you start making notes on a notepad of like, oh, what if an arena looked like this and these enemies came? Do you ever work like that, or is it always in in the system? Yeah, no, I, it's it's always straight in the engine. Oh, um, I yeah. can't I can't think of a single time I, I you know I I have a note I have a notepad that I keep with me for game design stuff, but I don't think I've ever drawn on it. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I like to hear people think about the what they're what they're designing. Everyone works differently. Hmm. Well, there, there were times I I used to think. Like I'd I'd have a cool idea in my head and say, okay, this you know this is this could be a, a fun idea. Let's give it a go. But and I'm usually so sure about it in my head that this is going to be a good thing to put in the game. But when it comes to executing it, it's usually when I find okay, maybe maybe it didn't work out the way I intended. Maybe I should should try something different. Um, I, I usually I, I intentionally try to keep things as loose as possible when it comes to designing stuff. Um, like even right now, I'm having this issue with. The, the first level of episode three like it's fully done and playable but i'm looking back at it i'm like okay i've completely replicated what i had in my head it was a good idea in my head but now that i play it it, it just doesn't feel that good oh. um the stuff like that i usually say okay 
go back to the drawing board, go back and take what's good, throw out the stuff that isn't good, and just you know redesign it to yeah, you just just keep redesigning it. Can I ask um, where the corruption zones idea came from? Um, that was also I, th I can't remember where the reason exactly. I can't remember why I put those in. I, I, it's just one of those things in my head that I wanted to try out. Um, I think it was because at the beginning of episode 2 it introduces you to the plasma gun and I wanted to say okay I want to have a section where players can just yeah. go nuts. Don't Use the plasma. Don't own. ignore this gun. Yeah. Check it out. Exactly, yeah. Um, and it sort of worked at the time but then I realized that you know a lot of people had play, you know, certain play styles they wanted to stick to and I kind of felt like it was restricting them from, you know, having fun with the game. It's like saying, okay, you have to use this gun. Um, so if we are you know, going back to the community and Discord. It was another thing I stuck up on there. I was like, okay, I'll put a poll up saying, okay, how many people want to have two guns instead of one, you know, in a corruption zone? Um, and that might be something we yeah, I'll be changing in the future. It's okay, some zones are one weapon, uh, but most zones are probably going to be two weapons. Yeah, it's uh, like like I said in, in my review of it. I think it works really well for the first two corruption zones. Plasma, mm. get it? You got a new gun. People are coming into this. They're already used to how they're playing. They don't need to use the plasma, so maybe they're not going to. And also the plasma, like at first before you get mods, you're like, eh, whatever. Plasma, like mm. uh, I've got all my machine guns and stuff. And so I I like how you get them into just using just the plasma with the one mod mm. because that's how it came alive for me. I was like, oh, I have to mm. use this gun, so I will. And, mm. um, you know, uh, sorry, everyone, to bring up Doom Eternal again. I'm, I, I apologize. <laughs> but, I mean, it's it's like the spirits in in Tag 1, where we're like, mm. people were like, God damn it, I have to use this microwave beam mod that I never used just to kill this one enemy. And then people do it for a while, and they just start leaving that mod equipped as a result, and then they start using it. And then you've got mm. all these people who are like, holy shit, this mod has a whole lot of utility that I never realized. And so it's, you put people through a little bit of pain of something that they're, people that are like, no, don't get me out of my comfort zone. Don't make me do this. And, but mm. like in the end, at the end of the day, they end up discovering something that becomes incredibly useful and that they enjoy. And that's how I felt about that first plasma zone. And also the, the second corruption zone with a rocket launcher where, mm. Uh, you have to use the remote detonation and there's the drones in the air and I'm like how did I never think of that I'm, I'm the guy that's made all this strategy video on the remote detonation mod for Doom Eternal and I never thought to use the remote detonation mod of the rocket to kill the drones instead of getting on top of them why did I never think of that <laughs> and and, and it, it changed the way I played a lot of the game and, mm. and but, but then after that, you are, you run into corruption zones where it's like uses a super shotgun, and it's like well, everyone knows how to use a super shotgun. But mm. those but those first two, man, I think I think I think you did something really good with having just a, those short corruption zones on those two weapons um, because the the rocket launcher didn't have a. I mean, it had what were the mods of the original rocket launcher in the first episode oh. before you changed it? So the first. Uh, I think the, the only change to the rocket launcher was the, um, I believe it was the, the multi. Yeah, the, the lock on. Ability. Yeah. yeah. So it, when it first shipped, it had, it had always had remote detonation, but it didn't have any upgrades you could yeah. purchase. Um, so there was a short update um, in August, which basically added the upgrade ability of multi loaded rockets, which is funny because that ability was always there on the rocket launcher, like as far back as 2019. But. I just took it out of the game because I felt it was too overpowered. Um, How do you feel about it now? Um, I mean, seeing it work with all of the, you know, stuff like the plasma gun, like you could fire four rockets at once, grab them all with the plasma gun, and then throw them in another direction. Just seeing stuff like that has been a lot of fun. It's um, so cool, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> you told me about it. Like, I was, I was working on that review, and I was like, this mm. is cool stuff. And you're like, yeah, you can actually charge up all the rockets and throw it and I was like what you can throw your own projectiles at them it doesn't have to be enemy projectiles I, did, I hadn't stumbled upon it and man mm. that just it takes the game to a whole new level uh, let, let's talk about that um, let's talk about the plasma rifle from the moment you decided to include one 
Walk me through the story of how that gun ended up being what it is today. Because you have created I, the greatest plasma rifle to ever exist in the game, I think. How did that happen? It was a complete, complete accident. <laughs> so, <laughs> like when, I, when I first checked it in, it was basically just a plasma gun with the, mic, uh, with the microwave beam. And that was it. Uh, I wasn't going to do anything else with it. But, oh, uh, uh, b- before you continue, was it the microwave beam as it is now with the triple lock on ability and also going through walls? Or was it like a single lock, a single lock on microwave beam? So, because that's I, I want to know that too. I want to know everything. Yeah, yeah. So it was uh, it was multi, multi. Uh, yeah, I think it was the same as it is now with multi being able to target multiple enemies. I wasn't supposed to go through walls. There's actually a bug, but um, it's probably gonna stay in there. It's cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't intentional, but um, seeing people use it that for that purpose was quite neat. Um, for the microwave, yeah, I'm pretty sure like. Day, like day one, it was going to be just a plasma gun with a microwave beam. Um, was that the, was that big? I mean, is that a Doom Eternal inspiration, or is that did that come from you being a Ghostbusters fan, or like where did microwave beam come from? Actually, hang on, I lie. So, I think what happened was originally it was going to be you shoot plasma with your primary fire, and your secondary was to lock on to multiple targets and. From there, it was kind of like the the link gun from Unreal Tournament. Unreal Tournament, so okay, to, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's going to be you target multiple targets, you hold down primary fire after you've locked onto them, and it will basically just shoot plasma at you know, like plasma, plasma orbs. Multiple targets. Well, it's going to be a line, but it okay. wasn't going to be like a microwave line. Uh, okay. That microwave thing came in quite late. Uh, originally, there was going to be a microwave gun, and uh, I did a bunch of effects for like, okay, you know shoot the microwave gun at the enemy, they, you know, expand and eventually explode into, you know, popcorn, which is, which is kind of amusing. <laughs> but uh, when I took that gun out, I was like, okay, this functionality is here. It's, okay, maybe I should just, you know, attach to the plasma rifle. So instead of just, just firing beams, it also, you know, adds microwave damage. Um, what's, uh, w- but, what's the difference? I guess it's more of just a... A visual thing, really. Um, okay. Yeah. So, like, because what it was originally was you target multiple enemies, fire your beam, and then a would They'll just basically gib when they die. But now instead, it has like a uh, like a shader effect where the polygons would expand, so they mm-hmm. look like they're fat, and then they'll <laughs> just gib on the end. Um, but the the projectile grabbing ability that was a very very late addition. Um, I think it came down to. When I was playing with the plasma rifle, I didn't really feel, you know, I felt I could get more out of that weapon. I wasn't sure how, totally. but yeah, I, uh, I can't remember where that idea came. Oh, no, I got it. So what it was originally was you would, it would, would only grab your own plasma projectiles. So you'd shoot a bunch of plasma and then you'd target it. Mm. And when you've targeted your own projectiles, they'll basically stay in midair. And the more you hold down fire, the more that grow. And eventually, you'll get this big orb of plasma that you can just chuck at any enemy. Oh, okay. Question: can, can does it still work that way? Can you? No. No, uh, I didn't think so. Not. Yeah. That would be crazy. Um, it would be good. Yeah, it would be pretty neat. But the, the original version I did, it just didn't feel that satisfying. Um, yeah. Especially. So then I was kind. Of, yeah. With a lot of the weapons I designed for Turbo, like I will work on a feature and then I would not find it hey yeah i wouldn't think it's worth pursuing so i wouldn't take it out though i'd just basically turn it off which is handy because later on down the line when i'm like okay that functionality i made for that weapon i could probably put it to this weapon i then still have the code lying around so i could just resurrect that weapon and say okay Hmm. something that was originally for this weapon can now be for this weapon um and i think that's what happened with the the uh projectile grab was i basically said okay bring this feature back online, but make it grab any projectile, not just, you know, plasma orbs. And uh, when I did that, it was, yeah, it just felt really good to play with. It's insane how how good it feels, because um, le- learning how to grab, like, large enemy projectiles and send them back at them, and then learning to, to grab your own projectiles 
it, like like I said in my video, I was like, can I shoot a rocket and a super super shotgun sticky grenade and catch them both <laughs> and then throw? It's like, yes, I can. That's insane. Yeah. And, and then I, uh, um, you updated the boss to have like a new projectile attack. He shoots like this square laser mm. th wall at you, and I was like, can I grab that? Yes, I can. <laughs> I just throw yeah. it right back at him. <laughs> Although that one doesn't work as well as I'd like to, because. Uh... I need to make it center it, so when you grab the wall, it'll basically be a little bit offset. Um, so I, I, there is a patch coming in the future that does center it a bit more. Can, um, can I give a little behind the scenes information? We can always cut this out of the interview if we need to. Yeah, it's, but, it's, um, it's all good. We we were talking before before Act Two came out. We were talking because you sent me the you sent me the early early version of it, and I was playing with this plasma rifle, and I was like, this is great, this is great, but I feel like I can't see what I'm shooting at, because previously when you when you absorbed all the projectiles, they centered directly over where the reticle is, so you had this big glowing orb of energy, and I was like, I can't even see what I'm launching this at, and I was like, what, and I, and I, I remember I messaged you, and I was like, what if it's like Ghostbusters, where, where like you're holding it in the air? And mm. and then you launch it at the enemy, and you're like, okay, cool. And then you implemented that, and you sent me the update, and I played it, and I was like, this is great. But now it's it's launching like diagonally down from the air, mm. which made it in impossible to judge like the distance because I'm I'm aiming at a guy, and I release it, and then it like goes over them, or it goes yeah. down into yeah. the ground. And I was like, okay, what if you have it above them, but the moment you release it, it sucks it to the center and sends it in a direct direct line. And then you, mm. you put that in, and that's where it's currently at. And yeah. the, it, it feels so, so good. And it's like, I'm so goddamn proud that I was able to be to work with you on that, because, um, because it is the coolest gun. Yeah, it definitely made it a, a lot better. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate that feedback on that. Oh, dude, it, it, you, you're, dude, uh, I appreciate you reaching out in the first place, all right? Because it was, uh, I mean, if if I could, if I can have any kind of positive effect on on a game that I love this much, I'm I'm very happy to do it. It's it's great. I'm 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 glad that I've been able to be involved in in whatever limited limited capacity I have been. Yeah, it's been yeah, it's been great. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, actually. I must say, yeah, you, bringing up that notepad document I have, I have a, a whole section dedicated. It's called the, the Mayo section. It's, <laughs> it's like a bunch of notes from your videos. I'm like, oh, okay, these are these also a few notes I have to address. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's that's funny. That's funny. No, the, the, when, when I saw the, the, the Mayo Easter egg, I just... I just I just died, man. Like I had never that had never happened before. I mean, I th there's one in Deadlink now, which is hilarious. But like the the one in yeah. your game was the first time I ever seen that, and that was but quite a quite a moment I shared with some with some close friends. <laughs> but the reason I the reason I checked that one in there because I remember you said something about um the invisible walls. In yeah. The one. Uh huh. It's like yeah, they 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 were quite restrictive. So I was like, okay, what if I what if I push these back a little bit? You know, based on what you said yeah and i was like oh, okay well now i have all this extra space so like, oh, maybe i should chuck a secret in here and i was like okay well yeah, well that's that's what i said i said <laughs> I, when, looking out that way and seeing that open mm -hmm. window in the distance i was like this feels like a secret <laughs> like what and i'm trying to get there and i'm hitting this invisible wall damn it <laughs> yeah and you've actually put a secret there <laughs> yeah yeah um I, I must say it's uh going forward with episode three it's, it's something that i've had in the back of my mind that you know, okay, players now have all of its expanded movement abilities. So, you know, you could grab onto your rockets, you could grab, you know, grapple onto your rockets, uh, and you could jump off walls. And, you know, going forward, I've had to be very, uh, it's made me have, I've had to change the way I think about level design now. So now I have to make levels. It's like, okay, if it looks like you can get to it, I want to make sure players can get to it. Yeah. Um, and thinking of, you know, when I started, episode one like my mindset with the game was very different like i was a very different developer back then to what i am now it's yeah, a bit of a pain because i have to go back to episode one now knowing that players are gonna try to get to all of these sections they're not supposed to do in it now right I'm, people are you know, grappling onto rockets in level one now <laughs> yeah because you, you could take basically everything you get in the game in the later stages you could take back to episode one and i'm like okay well now players can basically jump 
like five times the distance that you originally could you know they're gonna see all the ugly stuff that you've hidden behind the walls yeah yeah so I, it's a lot of um there's a lot of stuff i have to retroactively kind of fix now that i've given players this crazy moveset um, yeah which is something i you know I, I love giving players this freedom but at the same time it it's it's kind of hard to develop a game that kind of caters to you know all of these different movement styles so it's like when i started creating turbo i wanted to make something like quake like you know level design like quake um okay lots of corridors and you know narrow spaces um and now it's kind of changed like now everything has to be you know massive and accessible um, it doesn't have to be but there's always there, there's be, something yeah, to be but... said about restricting players and putting them in situations mm. where well, like the things that they're used to doing don't mm. apply anymore and uh, it that's limitations is what is what fosters creativity in the end yeah because if you let people just do whatever they want all the time through every mm. level they don't learn anything and they don't come out mm. of anything with any kind of memorable experience I don't think hmm it's definitely something I I'm a bit worried about going forward with you know future projects. Like if I want to make another first-person shooter, I will, I'd love to do something that's a bit more um, restricted and how players can move with it. Like I want to, you know, I'd love to make something like the original Quakes, where it was very, you know, a small amount of weapons, small amount of enemies, but just really, really good level design. Um, but it is also a concern in the back of my mind. It's like okay, if I make a game after Turbo, that's another first-person shooter. Like I don't want people expecting like another yeah. turbo overkill with a crazy amount of movement do a um, 2d beat em up man that'll make me happy <laughs> yeah just pivot something completely different like yeah. do an rts or something <laughs> yeah yeah why not why not um yeah. like, do you uh do you have ideas like you said if you do a first person shooter next i mean do, are there any mm -hmm. ideas that you're tossing around for what you might want to do next once yeah, turbo, overkill, it, it, turbo overkill act 3 is done yeah, there's like there's a couple of like concrete ones that I, I definitely know are gonna happen. Uh, like I've been teasing for quite a while. I, I don't, I'm not sure if you know of a, a, a Doom mod I made uh, a few years back called Total Chaos. Yes, that's what you're famous for. Yeah, so I, I'd love to go back and revisit that world and try and bring it, you know, to modern audiences with something a bit more modern. Because that that was made with the GC Doom engine, which is a really good engine but when it comes to actually yeah it's it's an amazing engine like you know you got mm. people making full games of it now yeah, like, have you seen solaco it, yeah it's, jesus it's, christ <laughs> it's, it's crazy uh, i saw a guy also make a uh like a full 2d platformer with it which i never thought was possible i saw um, someone post on twitter that there were a fixed camera classic survival horror game that they're that they want to build in GZ Doom. I was like, I'm all down for that, man. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, but the, the, the flexibility that engine has. The only problem is when I develop Total Chaos is if you open up a source code for that, it's a complete mess. Like, <laughs> it's, it's like I, if I were to go back to that project and try and make it work with more, you know, a wider range of uh, computer setups, I, I just wouldn't be able to do it. Well, I mean, um, do you work that, alone? Do you have anyone that can help you on this kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, for the most part, I work on my own, though. Um, usually. Uh, I mean, are you looking to expand like, maybe someday? Like, uh, go to like a three man or five man project on future projects? Eventually, but um, I quite. I, I mean, I definitely want to keep things small. Um, okay. I have worked with studios in the past, which have just been, you know, there was about five of us. Um, but um, I definitely prefer to keep things as small as I can um, and because usually, it usually comes down to I'm, I'm not really good at managing people I've found I've learned that the hard way it's like you know if, okay if I hire a contractor to you know help me out with a job it usually doesn't I'm usually quite slack with communication which um, I guess it's just something I've haven't you know I haven't fully figured out how to run a company and stuff like that yet um, but yeah, I mean, Total Chaos is definitely it's, it's definitely the next thing. Like, I want to put that in a more modern engine, something like Unreal. And uh, okay, 
give that project a bit of a facelift. But um, there's also, I've also got a massive list of stuff I really want to do. It's just a matter of the problem I have right now is it's like I, you know, finishing my first game, uh, I've just got too much stuff I want to make. I'm just not sure what to, what to make first. Hmm. <clears throat> One second, I'm sorry. Sorry, I had to uh, adjust something here in in the room. All good. So, if you bring Total Chaos to another engine, uh, are you talking about just like keeping it the way it is, you know, as a first person experience, or or continuing something about that world and possibly another genre of game? It's a. Uh... I would say I would like to try and port over, you know, a significant amount of what was from the mod, what people like from the mod. I mean, I will admit that there are some aspects to it that haven't really aged too well from, you know, going from a dirt mod to, you know, a full standalone horror experience. Um, I've always been dabbling in my head. It's like, okay, do half of it a remake and half of it something new. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still very early days, so I'm not really too sure which direction it's going to go in yet. Okay. Um, let's see, I have a couple of questions here. I wanted to ask, uh, what's been the most challenging aspect of, de of developing Turbo Overkill? Ooh. Any walls that you ran into? Um, good question. I think, I think the hardest thing for me to grasp with it is, uh, I mean, Early Access is a really good model, but at the same time, Something I did not anticipate going after releasing episode one was there are a lot of people that love the experience that is there. And when you go through and you start making changes to it um, for what you think is a better vision for the game, some people aren't going to like it. It's been very hard for me to kind of grasp a kind of a balance of, you know, trying to make it better for, you know, the majority of people and try not to upset too many people. Um, that's something that's been really hard to, to get my head around and it's definitely made me a lot more cautious going forward uh, you know with episode 2 and 3 it's just making sure if I do go back and change the game experience I, I need to make sure it's, it's going to be the right change for the game um, that's probably been the hardest part for me trying to manage what the game is exactly because it's you know when I, when I started episode one, I just basically ran in and I was like, okay, just anything I think is cool, just chuck it in. Sure. Because um, it wasn't anything back then. It was just basically, <clears throat> well, this isn't a thing. Just see the way it goes. But now I Here's just a bunch of fun mechanics and some awesome levels I made, basically. Exactly, yeah. But but now people have an expectation of what the game should be. And I kind of want to make sure I, I keep it, you know, keep as many people happy as I can, really. Um, which has been the hard part for me is... I, I kind of have to have a bit more thought into what I do now, rather than just throwing, throwing it at a wall and you know throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, are there, are there any directions that you started taking the game in that you just uh, that you decided to go against? Um, sometimes I mean sometimes I I do question myself a lot, um, even with episode three. Like I have a set direction that I've kind of had since the beginning of where I want the game to go, but even now I'm questioning, you know, say, is this the right way place to play the game? Um, yeah, it's... it's. Does, it, does that come yeah. from the reception of episode two, or does it just come from you playing through what you've made and, and starting to question it? A, a little bit of both. Because um, I, I usually find stuff that stuff I put into episode two, which I didn't think people would like, like I've seen a lot of people gravitate towards that and say, okay, this is some a mechanic I really like, or this is a level I really like. Um, so it has been a bit. I have done. Fortunately, the way I work, it's very float. It's very liquid, so I can pivot in any direction that I feel people are going to enjoy more, which mm -hmm. has been which has been nice. Um, but it's just been a hard uh, sort of mentality. I've had to sort of break and say, okay. This is no longer it's no longer my game anymore. Like it's it's you know everybody who's invested you know mm. time and who loves this game it's it's all their game now. Like I have to make sure what I'm doing is you know 
what's best for the game if, if that makes sense yeah well the, you um, since the release of episode 2 the biggest change that I've seen is the Ripper boss fight and the Ripper boss mm. fight is so much more fun now man yeah well, it's uh, following another one of your suggestions <laughs> would be you know adding the, the enemy waves and um, that's that's that yeah, it definitely made the boss yeah, fight a lot it's, more, it's, a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, it's great because it, it was just it was just such a big space for one mm. enemy, and mm. it is like your combat your combat flow is based around multiple enemies. I was like, you gotta get some other dudes in here, and it was mm. and now now I really enjoy. It. I I've thought about doing an update video about it because what I say about it in my review just doesn't apply anymore. Uh, but I'll probably just wait till uh, episode three comes out and just like. Put it at the put it at the front. Yeah, I, I still need to fix. Uh, I still need to fix Jazz. Um, he's a bit. He's still a bit the same. Or he's basically the same as what he was when he released. Mm. Um, Moore's been a funny one to balance because half the people have said that boss fight goes on for too long, and then half people half the people have said it's perfect. There's mm. another thing. It's like okay, I got to make sure if I update the more boss fight, it's going to be going in the right direction because well, I can't just update it and then. Well, you know, it doesn't. It's not that it goes on too long. It's it only it, it only goes on too long if you die because there's no checkpoints. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that, if, even yeah. that is a um, it's a bit of a controversial subject as well. Like you know, because I, I usually bring this stuff up a lot with the Discord community, and a lot of them say, "Yeah, you know, this is a good change. Like add checkpoints into the more boss fight." But then there's a lot of people that don't want that added as well. So it's it's definitely something that I think needs a lot more testing um which is sort of something else i learned as i was developing turbo is letting people get a hold of beta branches um mm. so I, right now even there's a beta branch out which has a lot of upcoming gameplay tweaks um which i feel you know it's a good way to gauge you know like putting it out there and for a while and seeing if people enjoy it before doing like a full release um mm. What is there a level in the game that you are the most proud of? Not just talking um, about episode two, but like overall, is there a level that you just like, man, I'm really happy with that one? Probably. It's hard to say. I, I I feel I feel that a lot of the levels at the beginning of episode one, um, especially the stuff like open season and battle battle alley, I feel were the closest I ever got to what I imagined in my head for what the game could be and you know when I went to execute those they, it turned out you know I was really happy with how those levels turned out um, and also yeah I, I'd say that a lot of the levels near the beginning of episode one um, were, were my favorite um, had a lot of fun with uh, I think it was Dead Plaza with the holographic panels um, mm. oh I love that, that level was, yeah, that's uh, that was something that I worked, I worked on for quite a while. I had no idea if it was going to work, um, but I mean, I, 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 I'm reasonably happy with how the execution on that turned out. Um, just having you know throwing in an unexpected element into the level that yeah, know, it's it's fun to look at. Yeah, um, it definitely made me want to add more destruction to levels going forward. But unfortunately, I uh, with the process I had sort of set for making levels that wasn't really flexible for adding more dynamic geometry oh i see so it's it's difficult to do that in the engine yeah well that 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 holographic panel thing was quite a hack it was basically um i had a mesh and basically if you shoot the mesh it will find the closest uh vertice and it will paint, like give it a different vertex color and through those vertex colors it will basically render it you know um as a uh unbroken or broken part of the panel um i would love to try to get try to get more of that into the game like into other levels but unfortunately it was uh um yeah it was a bit taxing trying to get that stuff to work reliably uh well you know what we're coming up on an hour here uh i got a couple more questions if you, uh to wrap this up um i wanted to ask uh what was the most exciting part about developing Act Two? Um, definitely, hmm. definitely more of like post-release, just seeing all of the bits players. I mean, I, I get a lot, I get a big kick out of watching people 
play the game and I try and watch as many streams as I can. Um, that has been fun, you know, seeing some mechanics like resonate quite well with people and seeing people find, uh, like find new play styles through mm-hmm. the new tool set. Like my favorite thing right now is seeing people do, you know, shoot a rocket, grab one to the rocket, then grab the rocket and throw it at an enemy. Yeah. Um, that, that stuff's a lot, that stuff's really fun to watch. Just seeing, you know, the mechanics work in ways I did not expect people to use them. Um, well, you know what? Speaking of the mechanics, I have a question. Um, you get ammo back when you're killing people in turbo time. and hmm. um, But sometimes I notice that some guns just don't get ammo back while I'm doing that. How is that calibrated? Like, like, the, like the ion cannon gun. Well, that's not getting ammo back every time I kill someone with turbo time. So how is it set? So basically, if you have the so if you have the augment equipped that lets you the pinata one, I think it is that gives you ammo back. Mm-hmm. Um, what it will do is whenever you pick up a single ammo piece, it will give you a set amount of uh, shells, bullets, heavy bullets, rockets. Actually, not not rockets, sorry, uh, plasma. But yeah, the there's enough with rockets. rockets <laughs> Yeah, there's enough rockets uh, that 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 needs a bit of a rebalance. <laughs> so. I, you know, I think I would agree with you. Uh, that's how I yeah. felt the first time I played it, and then the second time I played it because I was using rockets all the time. I was like, I don't have any rockets, <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it depends on how many rockets you're using, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when when it comes to rockets and uh, ion charges, the problem is like if you were to kill like a, a you know a normal fag in turbo time, it will drop about five or ten. Um, like ammo pickups and if you were to pick up every one of those it's like it's okay if you only get 10 bullets but if you get 10 rockets that's a that's yes, a huge yeah, difference absolutely um so the way it does it is if you pick up a uh ammo vial i mean a uh ammo pickup it'll have like a randomized number say okay if you count from zero to 100 and if the numbers are randomly above uh 80 then give the player a rocket so it won't give you a rocket every time you pick it up it's only okay. sometimes um Actually, that was a recent update. Um, also, the Iron Cannon was a recent update because that originally didn't give you any ammo. Yeah, um, I, I, I never got anything from it. Yeah, but I think... Uh, I can't remember if it's deployed or not, but I think now it does the same logic for that. It will, If the number's above a random threshold, it will give you some uh, Iron Charge. Yeah, like, Although, I, is it like a lower percentage? Because, I mean, that gun is insane, right? You don't want to give yeah. people that all the time, but you don't want to give them nothing because I was trying to replay Act 1... And you literally can't use the gun because there's no ammo pickups for it. Oh yeah, well, that, that was another change we, uh, the community suggested was um, adding iron charges to the shops. And I can't remember if it's in episode one or not. Um, well, you can't buy ion charges in the shops on the higher difficulties because you can't buy ammo at all, right? Oh yeah, yeah, so, that's right, yeah. So being able to get it at least in a small percentage from the turbo time would make that gun usable in the first act. I don't know how how much you've tuned that but it would be nice to be able to use that gun here and there on, on replay yeah so the uh so the rates i've got here i'm pretty sure this is live i'm not entirely sure but the, you should get iron cannon uh ammo from the from the ammo pickups it's cool. like uh if the numbers like if it's above 90 percent yeah so, yeah like a 10 percent probability of getting what like five rounds or something uh, right now it's set to one. One. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah it sure. Probably, probably could be a, probably could be a bit higher. <laughs> yeah, two. But, uh, two of the most or something. Because I mean yeah, that gun. I'll, that gun wrecks. I'll, I'll change it to two. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think with the logic when it comes to ammo placement for the iron cannon, I kind of did it like the BFG from mm-hmm. uh, 2016, where yeah. you'd have you know, every now and then it will be treated like a power up, where you just have like a a BFG ammo. Mm-hmm. Um, ammo box in an arena. Totally. Um, that was my original logic for that, but I didn't really. I don't think it worked as well as I as I thought it was going to work. Hmm. Can you uh, let's see? I'm going to wrap this up. What games are you looking forward to in 2023? Um, definitely Stalker Two. I've All been right. waiting on that one for about ten years. Yeah. Now. Um, ever, ever since I played the first one, I was just holding out for a sequel. Um. That that looks incredible. I yeah, looking forward to checking that out. Um, I got. I, I've never. I must confess, I've never played a God of War game. Oh, but I recently man. just picked up. Yeah, I, I recently picked up the uh, the one before Ragnarok. Uh, the one that came to twenty eighteen. 
Yeah, no. yeah. Well, you're talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not the best. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's it'll be it my first a different. It's a different Wars, game, man. Though. It's a, it's a it's like originals and new. They're completely different games, right? So yeah, I can recommend the originals. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. hey, you may, dude, you may love it. A lot, a lot of people love it. So <laughs> you may just love it. But yeah, I don't know. It's it's. He, I, I don't really find I get enough time to play games these days. Um, I usually get a lot more enjoyment out of just making stuff rather mm-hmm. than playing games. Like usually, if I if I sit down and play something like Doom, and I play it for about half an hour, and I'm like, well, I kind of have to just be making my making own thing. Making your own thing, sure. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, but yeah, def- definitely Stalker too. That's probably the one that's on my radar at the moment. We've also got the Dead Space remake coming out, and the mm. uh, Resident Evil Four remake also, and mm. the Silent Hill Two remake is also coming out. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, I've I've never played Silent Hill, oh. and I have only played the second Resident Evil, the the remake. Oh, okay. That's a solid so, game. So like. Just, like it's funny because with Total Chaos, I get a lot of people saying, "Oh, this is very Silent Hill inspired." It's like, yeah, but I've never played Silent <laughs> Hill. <laughs> oh man, I, I'm working on a because uh, I've never actually talked about Silent Hill on my channel. I, I've mentioned it. I mentioned it all the time when I'm making comparisons, but I don't actually have a video about Silent Hill, and I'm I'm working on that right now. And so I'm going back. I just like just today I replayed. The original 1999 Silent Hill, and recorded it all, and I'm just like, you know, flaws and all, and it's man, what an incredible series! I'm just happy, mm. happy to be covering it. If if you can ever get your hands on, on the original Silent Hill or Silent Hill Two, then yeah, you should play it. Yeah, definitely. I uh, I'll keep an eye out for it. I mean, I heard there was a remake of the second one, but I heard. Well, also heard it wasn't that good well i mean it's not out yet but i mean we're all worried considered who's making it and considering how the oh, trailer yeah. looks so uh, i'm not worried so much about how it's going to play and i know it's going to look great i'm worried about the story and i think that's what most mm. people are worried about how they're going to handle the story mm. um okay so uh last question can you give me well you, i don't know this is going to affect what you just said is going to affect this that you don't really get to play that many games i was going to ask you what your top five <laughs> is for 2022 20, oh, okay. Um, a lot of the games I'm mentioning have probably not come out in 2020. That's fine. Uh, I played, so I recently got a VR headset. I played Half Life Alex. Mm. That, that, I enjoyed That's that. That's pretty a lot. good. Um, I sat down for a weekend and played uh, Harod. So All right, yeah. That. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, Odious. Uh, yep. I, I've been playing that quite a bit on and off. Proteus um, is fun. But I, you know, after I put episode two out, I just sat down and played that um, for you know a good sort of week. Um, what else? Oh. Um, Scorn. Actually, no, I, uh, no, I shouldn't put Scorn on there. I've only played it for like half an hour. <laughs> well, it, it, nothing <laughs> even happens in the first half an hour. I know. I I got stuck on that uh that puzzle where you have to grab the thing. And like rearrange the the spheres. The first puzzle. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, but, a lot of people get stuck <laughs> there. Yeah. But I mean, like I've been waiting for that one to come out for a while, and um, I, it didn't take me long to get sucked into the the atmosphere of the sure. you know, the world they made. Sure. Um, one more. One more. Uh, oh, it's tough. Tough. Um, I mean, I I, I love Coltic. Oh yeah, yeah. That, was, that was quite good. Yeah. Yeah, um, Coltic's pretty but good. But I, I, I still need to get further. I, I haven't finished it yet, unfortunately. Did you play the Turtles game? Uh, the which one, sir? Ninja Turtles, Shredder's Revenge. Oh, no, no. I, I'm not much of a... I haven't played a lot of, uh, like, uh, fighter games. Beat-em-ups. Beat-em-ups, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, haven't given that a go yet. I, I, I kind of stick to a very specific genre. Um, sure. Unfortunately, um, I really do need to branch out though, because I remember actually, yeah, like I need, I need to branch out more because um, I remember I never played the original Dark Souls mm. um, until I worked for a company that was making a Souls like, and 
when I sat down and played it, I, I you know I looked at it and I was like, this isn't a game I'm going to enjoy, but I remember getting right. you know a lot of enjoyment out of that. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> it's a bit of a weird list, but I, I don't really get a lot of time to play games, unfortunately. That's understandable, especially I mean, as a one-man mm -hmm. dev team working on a on a project as big as this, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Sam, uh, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I hope the audience has enjoyed this. I'm pretty sure they have. I think there's a, a lot of Turbo Overkill players um, who are going to enjoy you know, hearing from you and hearing about your thought process and the design behind the game and, and your personal history with making games. And I just want to thank you for coming on here and sharing your time with us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for, um, yeah, putting the time aside. Uh, it's good talk. It's good to finally talk to you. Yeah. Thanks for being i found your channel for quite a while, um, ever since, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, ever since Doom Eternal, because uh, that was during, uh, that came out for us during the lockdown, so mm -hmm. that was basically all I played, and yeah. all I, you know, anything Doom Eternal was I, the only thing I consumed, so a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of your stuff, you know, from back then, um, yeah, so yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's an honor to finally be able to uh, be able to talk to you yeah it's been great we've been talking since since the demo uh review video came out and so it's been really mm -hmm. nice being able to talk to you and and help wherever i can and get to have these conversations and i mean i'm gonna cover your game going forward because you know i really believe in in what you're doing i think you have a really smart sense about the way that you're making this game and uh it's just been one of the one of the most fun games i've played in recent years so thank you thank you very much for turbo overkill thanks man i appreciate it all right everyone uh thank you for listening to this episode of profiles and gaming enthusiasm uh and uh i'll be back soon with another interview that i think you guys are going to enjoy a lot uh, so Sam, is there anything you want to pitch before we say goodbye? Any uh, links or projects you want to mention? Um, any games you want to draw attention to? Here's your moment. Ooh, uh, no, uh, no, pretty sure. <laughs> no, any movies you want to recommend? Anything? Um, anyone you want to insult publicly? Oh uh, no, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> that would go down well. No, it doesn't. Um, go well. It does not go down well. <laughs> no, um. I'm sure it's going to come to me after the interview. <laughs> I'll post it in the pinned comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, okay. Last last chance. Anything you want to mention? Um, I apologize for the bike level. For the what level? <laughs> the bike level. Oh, you apologize for the bike level. Oh. <laughs> yes. it, it is. It is next. It is next on the V factor list, though. So there, uh, there's some uh, there's no. some cool stuff coming out for that. Okay. Well, great. Yeah, well you, well, you know what? Before we go, I'll mention that when you sent it to me, I don't know if it had the option to change the camera view because when I played it, it was first person only, or 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 because now when you start it, you start on the on the bike view, but when I mm. played it, it immediately went into first person view, and yeah, uh, and I, was, I don't know if you couldn't change it or if you could, and I just didn't know. But I played the whole thing first person, and man, that is, it's way better if you can pull the camera out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the third person thing was uh, it's like one of Jaren's ideas. It was very last minute, but it did it, it did help giving the you know players the option. Yeah. Um, but that level still there's a lot of stuff that needs to be improved upon. Um, actually, I did just think of something to shout out. Um, yeah. I've been playing a lot of incision lately, which it's incision kind of, it has a lot of incision. Yeah, yeah. like it has a lot of a lot of dusk vibes to it. So playing that's you know straight after playing dusk again, it's been been a lot of fun. Yeah, I played in Incision. I played the first few levels. I, I want to say I played like four or five levels in Incision, and it's pretty fun. Hmm. I like the life yeah. system. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing I like is, uh, you know, just the art style and how um, hostile every, everything looks on it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's been fun. All right, uh, everyone. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, for tuning in, and this is uh, me and Sam saying goodbye. And I'll see you in the next episode. Later, everybody. <laughs>